might have remembered Jennifer was in a different role a couple of years ago, and she spoke at Wisdom 2.0, so it's really wonderful it's to nice have to you be back. back. Yeah. And um, she has a new position, which is really easy. She kind of just took a really easy job, I don't know why you did, <laughs> which is overseeing um, groups and communities at Facebook, of which there's about a billion people. Yeah. So uh, if you're in a, who's a part of a group and community at Facebook? My guess is the vast majority. Nice. Great. So we're going to talk about um, how to make your groups work well. We're also going to talk about uh, the difference between what it means to be a manager and what it means to actually be a part of a movement. And so I actually thought we, that might be a nice place to start sure. is um, how do you see uh, in your definition of what a manager might be and how does that differentiate from somebody who is a... Um, who is a, a movement builder yeah. and why that is important. So before I was at Facebook, as you mentioned, I spent the last four and a half years at change.org after having spent the 15 years before that in tech. And I had this kind of aha moment where I saw people, sometimes really unexpected people, kids and grandparents and people in prison, starting these movements on change. And I realized that in so many ways they had the same skills as people I had seen start and lead successful companies. Mm. And I just thought to myself, it's so interesting that there's this leadership thread that goes mm. through mm -hmm. all of these things, but that the most effective leaders mm -hmm. are those who don't just manage and go about their daily business, but actually rally other people behind mm -hmm. them around a common purpose. And so I have I basically saw five key things that, that these people have in common. Mm -hmm. One is creating a really clear and compelling vision. Mm -hmm. The second is inspiring supporters and mobilizing them around that vision. Mm -hmm. The third is effective techniques at persuading decision makers. Mm -hmm. Uh, the fourth is around navigating criticism, which mm -hmm. in this day and mm -hmm. age is mm -hmm. more common than ever. Like taking feedback yourself. Taking feedback uh, is part of it, and also just dealing how to think about haters and mm -hmm. other folks. And the, the fifth is around overcoming obstacles. And okay. so I basically looked at those things and found that, again, across activism and business, they were quite similar. Mm -hmm and that there were some techniques that each side could learn from the other. Mm -hmm. So for instance, activists tend to be much better at storytelling, mm -hmm. and business folks tend to be much better at using data. And when you put those two things together, you get these really powerful movement starters. Mm -hmm. And the big aha was that anybody can do yeah. this. Yeah. And so tell me about the word purpose, because that seems to be an important yeah. word, both in your book, but also in your kind of work at Facebook. Yeah. Um, can you say what that what that means to you. So if, if I'm living with purpose, how might that be different than living not with purpose? Yeah, for me, purpose is about understanding why something matters to you. Mm -hmm. So I think about, you know, again, I said a lot of it's about creating a compelling vision. A vision is your desired future mm -hmm. for the world, mm -hmm. and the purpose is why that matters. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think about people... Um, like, there's a story in the book about a woman named Amanda Wynn. She was uh, a college student who was raped in her senior year of college. Mm -hmm. And she did all the things you're supposed to do, which is go to the... Um, she went and had a rape kit done. She went to the police department. And she learned that in the state of Massachusetts, rape kits are only kept for six months. And then they wow. are tossed into the trash. Wow. which they would not do for any other crime. Yeah, yeah. And she said, I want to change this. I envision a world in which sexual assault survivors do not yeah. have to go back to the police and handle this sea of red tape every six months mm -hmm. to keep their evidence from being thrown away. And so she started a movement. She actually started a whole organization called RISE. Um, and she has a meaningful purpose for mm -hmm. why that matters to her mm -hmm. and why she wants to, to make the world better in this direction. And she actually was able to uh, create a set of volunteers. She did something really brave, which is that she emailed all of her friends, mm -hmm. everyone she knew, and she said, this is my purpose, mm -hmm. will you help me? Mm -hmm. And the response was incredible. She had lawyers and engineers and comedians and mm -hmm. all these people rally behind her mm -hmm. to support her. And then she did a number of other things that are outlined as steps in my book, including understanding the decision makers she was trying to persuade, mm -hmm. which in this case was both US Congress, really easy to persuade, <laughs> and, uh, 
and also then the state legislatures of each state. Uh, and now she has passed this bill called the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights unanimously in 2016 wow. in the United States Congress. It's one wow. of only 21 bills in modern history. Wow. wow. Passed unanimously. And she's a woman in her 20s with wow. no previous lobbying experience. It's just a person who just found something and wanted to right. create her. Wow, it's beautiful. And so what is it um, if uh, there's people here, and I know you've taken this job now, it's your short term, you, you just kind of started the job, but what is it that makes, in your vision, like um, at least a group on Facebook work versus not work? Like what is it, what are some parts that you've seen where it's like, oh wow, that really engages people, or oh that doesn't yeah. really engage people? Yeah, so the first thing is there's tens of millions of these right. groups. So there is a group for virtually everything you can imagine, and they work across all the topics you can imagine. It's true that yeah. some are more successful than others, but sort of like, do they work better on parenting mm -hmm. than on health? It's no, just like it's quite uniform. And what I see is that people start these groups around the things that are the most important things that really matter in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. They're our families, our um, neighborhoods, our health, our work, mm -hmm. the passions and causes that we have. And what really makes them work best is a leader who mm -hmm is willing to put the time into nurturing the community. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, Katerina Fake, do you know her? Yes. The yes. founder of Flickr. She once described community to me as being kind of like a cocktail party. And mm. if you start a community, you, you have to consider yourself like the host of a cocktail party. Uh -huh. When people arrive, you introduce them, you take their yeah. coat, you get yeah. them a drink, yeah. you start the conversation. Mm -hmm. If you were to start a community and then leave, mm -hmm. it tends to be mm -hmm. unsuccessful. So the ones that have the most passionate leaders do the best, and they're on every topic. And so somebody's willing to step up, put themselves out there, say, this is important to me, this is why this is important to me, right. welcome. They kind of embody that role. Right, and then sometimes what they do is, as these communities grow, they encourage other people to step up and take that role too. And sometimes it happens um, really quickly. Like there's a woman named Jennifer Cardenas who lives in, outside of Houston, Texas. And during the Hurricane Harvey, she was, had to evacuate last minute, and she wanted to start a community, mainly of people she knew, mm -hmm. to understand where people were, getting, were evacuating mm -hmm. to. She started this group, and she invited a bunch of her friends, but she left it open. She went to dinner. There were 300 people who had requested to join the group by the time she was done with dinner. She went to bed. She woke up. There were 30,000 people wow. in her group. And within wow. the next two days, 150,000 people had joined this group. Wow. And Jennifer herself ended up losing internet connection. So she couldn't be there mm. to moderate the group. And 80 other people volunteered to be mm. moderators. And they were able to rescue 8,000 people from wow. Hurricane Harvey wow. through this community. Wow. So. I also know like the Women's March, I think, was also they yes. used. Um, so I'm wondering, how do you see, because I think there's this place to help people organize, but there's also this desire to do good, social good. Um, but seemingly, you have the people who are organizing, let's say, against current gun laws, and you also have the people who are organizing for current gun laws, or against immigration, or for immigration. So if you're helping everybody organize, um, how, do you, how do you see your approach? Uh, is it really just giving people voice for whatever their voice is, or can you... Where is the role of swaying them yeah. towards certain things, or how does that? How do you navigate that path? It's because so certainly there's so many different strong feelings about yeah. this and about that, and and we have this at change as well. I, I think both of these are really meant to be open platforms where vo mm -hmm. all voices are welcome, um, and we do allow both sides of every issue. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things I think is so interesting about community is that it does allow both bonding over the things we have in common and bridging to start to understand the things that mm -hmm. we may disagree on. So mm -hmm. one of the greatest parts of this is that sometimes the community can be about something completely unrelated, mm -hmm. like a certain kind of dog that you all mm -hmm. love. Or, mm -hmm. you know, one of my favorites is there's a group called Very Old Skateboarders in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> For literally, it's like women in their 70s plus <laughs> who all skateboard. <laughs> and they found each other in this online community. But just because you love the same dog or you all skateboard together doesn't mean you necessarily have the same sure, opinion sure, on sure. gun rights or any other you know, political issue. And so one of the things we see happening in this, these communities is 
you start to get conversations that mm -hmm. actually bridge mm -hmm. understanding based mm -hmm. on building trust as a starting point. Mm -hmm. So that person that you've been communicating with, all of a sudden you find out, oh, shoot, right. there's a Democrat or they're a Republican, right. but you've already built a, exactly. built a bond with them. Right. Um, so I think, like, I know I have definitely this experience where I'll spend, like, an hour on Facebook. I'm like, oh, that was so rewarding. And then other times I'm like, what did I just do the last hour? <laughs> yeah. um, where did I go? And so there's both. And I'm wondering... Um, how do we support people in what kind of when they sign on, um, making that a more positive experience for the things that they want to see happen? And I yeah. know that's a hard kind of question because there's so many things going on. And, but I do, I feel like that's a question a lot of people have because they have these different experiences of sometimes going like, oh, wow, that was so rewarding. And other times like, oh, I kind of could have spent that hour yeah. doing other things. And I don't know from your world whether you've seen kind of common practices or things that support um, one versus the other. Yeah, I mean, this is something we think a lot about, and obviously this has you know, been a hot topic of discussion lately, especially. And one of the things we try to do is understand both with the people who work at Facebook and also working with academic experts mm -hmm. outside what it is, how social media can actually help or hurt your well-being. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we found recently is that when you are in actively interacting with mm -hmm. your friends and family and other people you trust online, when you're having discussion, when you're engaged, it actually can be helpful to your well-being. Mm. And it is also true that just passively scrolling mm -hmm. content may not be helpful to your well-being. And so one of the things we did recently is we actually changed the algorithm of Facebook to focus on what we call meaningful social interactions, mm -hmm. to say that's what we want. We want people to have their time be well spent to improve their well-being from using this. Mm -hmm. And so now we're focusing on trying to show people mm -hmm. the content mm -hmm. more from their friends and family and from these communities mm -hmm. that they care about in a way that we hope will improve So it's more things well-being. that I want to engage with and some versus just passively digest. I That's wanna, right. Like, and so interest. it may mean that people spend less time on Facebook overall, mm -hmm. and we're okay with that mm -hmm. because our goal is to try to make sure that this is a positive There's experience. Quality, positive. Yeah. One of the things we've seen too, and the um, and the reason why I'm personally so passionate about communities as a way to help that, is there's a lot of research now on um, loneliness as an mm -hmm. example. Like mm -hmm. there's a recent meta study done out of Brigham Young University. Mm -hmm. They looked at 218 studies on loneliness, and they found that it is actually more deadly than obesity. Wow. Being lonely is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Wow. And so I really do believe that platforms like this can help curb that, yeah. both in a way that they help you find people. Like I look at groups like Affected by Addiction, mm -hmm. where people feel so alone, mm -hmm. whether it's you or someone in your family struggling with this, which now in the US, the Pew study says it's one yeah. 50% of people yeah. know somebody struggling with addiction. And people just feel so alone. Yeah. And so they can find this community online that's really safe and supportive. Yeah. Um, and so we believe that that's a really helpful thing to yeah. offer to people. Now, did you have, because uh, you were writing this book, and then this job came, <laughs> offer, and it's on one level it's super exciting, but it also must be, like, that's just a huge responsibility. How do you, how are you <laughs> handling all this? <laughs> um, to be in charge of community of a billion, not, not like you're in yeah. charge of them, but you're responsible and sorry for enhancing <laughs> the, the quality of experience for a billion people. Yeah. Um, uh, do you ever wake up in the middle of the night and just go, oh my God, what do I, how what do, did I, do? I do? What did I do? Um, you know what? I generally wake up, I do wake up a lot in the middle of the night thinking about things, but um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I generally feel really lucky to uh -huh. have this job because my job is to support really incredible people who yeah. start these communities that mean so much to people. And it is a heavy responsibility mm -hmm. to try to do that right. And I think, I think we do a good job, but I think mm -hmm. we could do a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, and so that motivates me. Every time, I, mean, I spend a lot of time meeting community leaders, mm -hmm. and actually we just launched a program called the Facebook Community Leadership Program, which mm -hmm. is going to offer fellowships and community leaders and residents that come with funding and support mm -hmm. and so forth. So I get to spend time which, by the way, if anyone knows great community leaders, you should encourage them to apply to that. It's at mm -hmm. communities.fb.com. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that is what inspires me, talking yeah. to people who do this work. Yeah. And um, your book is coming out 
Uh, where? Yes, May 22nd. May 22nd. It is available for pre-order, okay. purposefulbook.com <laughs> or on Amazon. And um, can you say a little bit more about what motivated that? Was it seeing the kind of similarities of different movements, or how did that come Yeah, about? you know, it's a funny story, actually. What originally sparked it out is I was giving a talk at a conference kind of like this, and uh, someone came up to me afterwards and said, have you ever thought about writing a book? Mm. And I, of course, like maybe at some point had mm -hmm. thought about that, but not in the immediate term. And it turns out that person worked for Penguin Random House. Oh. <laughs> so we started a discussion about this book. But it's been, it took two and a half yeah. years, actually, yeah. because I do have a, other full-time jobs. And what's been amazing. And children. And, yeah, yeah. Two, two teenage daughters. <laughs> um, What's been amazing about it is that the world really has evolved quite a bit in the last two and a half years. And so I feel like the topic of the book, which is about how everyone can, can be a movement starter and how to do that, how to go from idea to mm -hmm. impact, is m more relevant even yeah. than it was. And actually, I've been adding stories to the book as things yeah. have evolved. And how do you, um, so Ev Williams, who started Twitter, who's been here a couple um, times, he, he was being interviewed uh, recently, and he said, um, he said, some, you know, I thought once we would give everybody a voice, if we could just get a platform that would give everybody a voice, the world would be so much better. <laughs> and he said, I was wrong. <laughs> um, and so it feels like there's this kind of transition we're going in where at first, like, it's like, wow, let's give everybody a voice. Yeah. And let's make their voice loud. And like, everybody kind of has their own um, thing. And then we're realizing, like, well, well that might, that can also just kind of create divisions because mm -hmm. now, like, People are, have very loud voices, and sometimes those voices aren't very positive, you know, because they're saying things that are very divisive. And so I kind of feel like now we're, we're in this new chapter where we're trying to envision, all right, what's the next uh, chapter look like for um, ways that people get a voice, but they're also we're kind of supporting con real human connection as yeah. part of that, and where we actually stop and go, wow, that really impacted me. Why did that? So I'm wondering if there's a, and this is, I'm just kind of going off on my own thing right now, but um, if there's a way that we can envision like really supporting um, self-awareness and compassion and empathy within environments where if I'm not seeing somebody's face, um, yeah. it, you know, it might be kind of harder for me, and yet, it, yeah, it's so powerful because you give expression to people who otherwise didn't have expression. Yeah, um, it's true. I mean, I think there are, there are some you know, and the ways technology can always be used for good, it can be used for bad too. Some of the things that are coming in the world of tech, I think actually are even more exciting in the world mm -hmm. of empathy building, like mm -hmm. VR as an example. Mm -hmm. I was talking to someone last night, a mom who says that her son uses VR and plays virtual basketball. He's seven. Mm. And she says when he goes out on the basketball court in real life now, mm. he's way more confident on the basketball court. Right. Um, and I was thinking in my head, all I could think about was empathy in yeah, that case, yeah. and how actually, even though we're not physically together, that this virtual world might actually be a way to create more real empathy between yeah. people that you don't meet face to face. There's a, um, and this, honestly, this is what I believe will solve mm -hmm. the world's division Please. right now. Uh -huh. And not VR, but empathy. <laughs> 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 um, I, there's a story in the book, actually one of my favorites, about a guy named Derek Black. I don't know if you know this. It was, his story was published in the Washington Post, and, and he later wrote an op-ed himself in the New York Times. But he's the son of the founder of Stormfront. And Stormfront is? Is one of the largest white nationalist organizations mm -hmm. in the country. Um, and he, when he went to college, he, at first, they, he was not public about who he was. And then he, once he was discovered, the campus really uh, ostracized him, which is understandable. understandable. Um, and instead of just everybody saying, let's kick him off campus, mm -hmm. you know, how can this person be here? One student said, what about if we invite him to dinner? It was actually an Orthodox Jewish student who invited him to Shabbat dinner at his house. Mm. And Derek went because mm. they were the only people who would talk mm -hmm. to him at that point. And they agreed not to talk about white nationalism. They were just going to treat him mm. as a human being. And week after week, he went to Shabbat dinner mm. at 
this person's house and built relationships and built trust and over time shifted his own opinion wow. and ended up writing this op-ed about why he left white nationalism. Wow. And now he's going around the country speaking and mm -hmm. so forth and we're, we're trying to learn from him as well mm -hmm. about what we can do to take that kind of empathy and love mm -hmm. to a larger scale. And it took one person to reach out exactly. and to say, let, let me get to know you beyond what story I might have That's with you. right, and that, that can happen offline. It can also happen online. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I, I really do believe that. It's about being listened to and being understood. Beautiful, great. Our time is just up, so <laughs> thank you so much thank for joining you. us.